On the 6th of January 1956, we landed in Halley Bay and found our way onto the top of the 100-foot ice cliffs. The motor vessel Totten in which we travelled is specially strengthened for work in the ice and built so that she does not so much break the ice floes as push them out of her way. Three tractors were used to transport our stores to the base site and the emperor penguins watched us with curiosity and amazement. The raft of heavy timbers forms the foundation of our hut. But nearly every day, snow would have to be dug off before starting work. In the center are the truss shoes into which the trusses go to support the roof and this is capable of standing a weight of 300 tons of snow. Most of the timber was cut before arrival and carefully labelled. The gable ends were assembled on the snow and required everyone except the cameraman to lift them up. Using this high lift apparatus on one of our tractors, we were able to lift this heavy mass of timber and place it in position. There were 30 of these half trusses to erect. It was hard to carry them as our feet sank into the soft snow and at least eight men were needed for each half truss. We found it easiest to place the center timber in the truss shoe and hinge onto that. And as this maneuver had to be done 30 times, we all kept to the same jobs each time and soon became quite quick at it. Occasionally, we would have distractions from our work like this whirligig of snow. It came from the southwest and passed across the stores dumps and the hut itself. Our one close bit of scenery was these icebergs on the horizon and they were frequently miraged like this. We also used the high lift on the tractor to take the drift snow well clear of the working area. Dr. Fuchs of the Transantarctic Expedition gave us these two puppies and they became very petted pets. and we weren't disappointed. But I think you'll agree they have a fascination and beauty of their own. But the drifting snow would get through the smallest holes and the Met Man had to clean out his equipment before he could read his temperatures. We used this temporary aerial when we talked direct to the BBC in London in March 1956. When it came to fixing the roofing felt, the temperatures were down in the minus 20s, so we had to use a very quick routine. The rubroid was warmed inside the hut and rapidly passed outside, but it had frozen hard again by the time it had rolled down the roof. We completed the final roofing and thus the outer shell of the hut by the 1st of April, less than four months after we arrived. Then the 40-foot high meteorological tower was built in the already fading light.
on calm, clear days, with the finest ice crystals in the air, we would see these beautiful mock suns and sun pillars. It took many weeks to dig out all our stores, and this could be done only in calmer weather, some under 10 foot of hard packed snow. But out of 220 tons, we only lost one item, a bale of cotton waste. Only a month of diminishing daylight remained when we completed the walls and the roof. The chimneys and ventilators show the portion completed first, and we lived in this part while working on the rest. The emperor penguins had started congregating on the sea ice before the onset of winter and greeted one another noisily on arrival. two miles on their fronts to pay us a call, using their feet for propulsion. This is their usual form of travelling over snow. By constant use, they can keep a hole like this in the sea ice unfrozen. Before the winter, we had filled our coal store with 300 bags weighing 90 pounds each, and these lasted us until late spring, when we had to restock from the main coal dump. this kind of digging until summer had rarely arrived. Even so, we dug out these double doors three times. in the vicinity of Halle Bay. Constant meter 
meteorological observations were kept en route, including the sea water temperature, the wind speed, and the air temperature. sunset bade the main party farewell as they left Montevideo and civilization behind them. We 
left Halle Bay on the 29th of January 1957 in remarkably ice-free seas. For most of the advance party, South Georgia was the first real land they had seen for over a year, and to all of us, the grasses and mosses seemed unbelievably green. A blue-eyed cormorant accompanied us as we entered Gritfiken Harbor on our return to civilization. 